Hello, and welcome to Grug Gaming, and welcome to a Let's Play of Dominions 5, Warriors of Faith. This is going way back. In fact, I think, if I remember correctly, Dominions was the first game I did a Let's Play for. Um, and it's Dominions 5 has been out for a while. I didn't play it when it came out right away. It was on sale. I decided to buy it. I've been feeling like I need some grand strategy. Dominions 5 is just a great game. So, we are going to do a Let's Play of Dominions 5. Now, previously in Dominions 4, we played Ermor, which was kind of the Roman Empire. And we played them in an early age game and a middle age game. And we got to see their fall from a great mighty uh, Rome down to a, a, an undead kind of empire. Well, we're going to play another early age game here for Dominions 5. So we're going to go ahead and create a world. Now, I just installed this, so I know nothing about... Um, I know nothing about Dominions 5, really, except for some very basic stuff. Uh, I just know what I remember from Dominions 4. So we're going to go ahead and play on a random map. And we're going to do this like we did before. So we're going to play on a medium-sized map. Sounds good. Uh, I'm not going to touch any of this stuff. I don't know what rivers do. Um, and we're going to leave this east-west wrap around and have a north-south border. That sounds fine. Uh, we're going to call this game... Let's... Play! Exclamation mark. All right. This is not a valid game name. Oh, apparently we're not allowed to have... We're not allowed to have special characters. That's okay. So again, we're going to go to the early ages. Now, if you're not familiar with Dominions, uh, it is a grand strategy game uh, done in turns where you have to take over a world, and the basis of the game is that the old god of the entire world has disappeared. And now all these demigods are vying to become the, the biggest god, to become the new great god of everything. And in order to do this, there are several thrones of ascension on the game map. And the first nation to take control of those thrones of ascension is the nation whose god becomes king of it all. Um, and then there are three ages you can play in. There's the early age, a middle age, and a late age. And this has been up here long enough. Hopefully you've had a chance to read it here. Um, but basically what it is, early age, technology is very small. Weapons are mostly bronze, um, you know, and wood and stone. And then magic is very strong. In the Middle Ages, it's kind of a midway point. Magic is a little bit powerful, but more weapons have been happening, so you get more iron and steel. And then in the late ages... Um, Almost everybody has iron and steel and super powerful armies, and magic is not nearly as powerful. Um, as far as how, how prevalent it is. But the few mages that are left have become specialists and are extremely powerful in their small little, uh, like, section of magic. So we're going to play an early age game. And again, the early ages are full of magic, and civilization is at its beginning. At most places, iron has not been thought of yet, and armors and weapons are made of wool, wood, stone, and bronze. Mages are most powerful in this age, and there is an abundance of magic resources. It is a time of legends. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to play against five... Five sounds good? Yep. We're going to play against five other AIs, or, or other players, is what we'll do. That'll leave us a lot of people on the map... Um, a good amount of conflict around. We'll see how we do. And now we need to choose our race. So, <clears throat> in the early ages, these are the races that are available. And they're all different. You have everything from uh, an ancient human kingdom that is very much uh, like, uh, like ancient Greece, but with ic guys with Icarus wings. All the way to, if you wanted, you have... Uh, Relay, uh, the time of the Abolus, you could basically play uh, monsters from the Cthulhu Mythos. <clears throat> That's how varied this game is. And every every race in this game is kind of based around the 
myths and legends of a specific real world um, counterpart part. So we've played Ermor, which is the like new religion coming up inside of Rome. But we have things from Amazon Queens to ancient Chinese. Uh, we've got Africa, um, South America, Mick Clan, like every type of you know collection of myths that you can think of are represented by somebody in this game. It is a really cool game. So we're going to do this. We played Ermor, and uh, we're going to play another human kind of based faction. We're going to play Olm, the Enigma of Steel. Now, Olm, the best way to think about this is think about it like Conan, basically. So we're going to say Olm. So here we have Olm, okay? <clears throat> we have Olm is a land of cold mountains and dense forest. These wild lands were settled by proud and fierce barbarians in ages past. Their ancestry has made the inhabitants of the forest stronger and more resilient to the cold climate than ordinary men. Upon becoming men, youngsters are given a single knife and left in the forest at first snowfall. Those who survive the winter are allowed to return to their family. The barbarians of Ulm live in small settlements, ruled by chieftains and warrior smiths who search for the enigma of steel. Steel is a sacred metal, and its maker is as well. Smithing has become the equivalent of making a sacrifice to the Lord, and no other culture has developed such skill in forging magical items. Horses are rare, and those who use them in warfare are held in contempt. Sneak attacks, on the other hand, are common, and many warriors use stealth to engage opponents in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So this is a race of barbarians. They're partial to cold, they have partial cold resistance, and they prefer cold climates. The military has strong medium infantry and stealthy infantry. They, Magic-wise, they have access to earth, nature, fire, air, water, some death, and superior magic item forging. Their priests are quite weak, and their holy spells are not extremely powerful. They can build standard forts, and forts produce 25% more resources. I know there's a change to forts in this game. I'm not really sure about it, but we're going to find out. So here's what we have available to us in this army. So we have our scout. Warrior scouts. Um, the warrior scouts are used are used to operate alone in enemy territory. They report to enemy, move, enemy movements, and the resources in enemy lands are invaluable to the prudent warlord. Don't worry, I'll learn how to speak. And so our scouts are cold resistant. Uh, they can move through snow easily, move unhindered in snow-covered lands. I know that there is a, a change to movement as well. Um, they're stealthy. They have a stealth rating of 40. They can survive in mountains. Creature reduced movement penalty when moving through highlands. Okay. And less likely to starve when they run out of supplies. They have forest survival and they're ambidextrous. They got two weapons. You can see they have a broadsword and axe. They carry a short bow, leather cap, full leather armor. They're not here to lead anyone. They're just a scout. But they can maybe fight off somebody if they try to get assassinated. We have our warrior chief. Oh, and they and in forest we can recruit uh, our two leader types. So warrior chiefs. The warrior chiefs are the martial rulers of the tribes of Ulm. Every tribe is led by a chieftain, a shaman, and a smith. The chieftain rules in matters of war, the shaman in spiritual matters, and the smith in judicial matters. Warrior chiefs are skilled warriors and able commanders. They wield heavy two-handed swords and wear scale mail armor. So we've got good armor, we've got an iron cap, look at that guy right there, the horns on his cap, and he has a great sword if he gets into damage. Also cold resistant, able to move through snow, also sneaky, can stealth around, has mountain and forest survival. We then have our warrior smiths. <clears throat> the warrior smiths are the rulers of the tribes of Ulm. Every tribe is led by a chieftain, a shaman, and a smith. Chieftain rules in war, the shaman of spiritual matters, and the smith in judicial matters. They alone have mastered the enigma of steel, and they make the weapons and armor used in tribal wars. Smithing has become the equivalent of making a sacrifice to the Lord, and no other culture has developed such skill in magical forging. 
Warrior Smiths are skilled in Earth and other elemental magics. So this is one of our mages we can recruit. The big thing we're looking at here, yes, they have a weapon. Yes, they have some armor. You know, they're okay there. But here's what we're looking at. Every one of these guys recruit is going to start with level 1 in Earth Magic. They're also going to get one level of another random magic. And then there's, there's Earth, Death, Fire, Water, Air. So they're either going to have Earth level 1, something else level 1, or they could get a second level in Earth and have Earth level 2. When they do research to learn new magic spells, they give us 9 points of research every turn for each one researching. Again, cold resistant and snow movement, mountain and forest survival. A resource bonus of 5. The unit aids in the production of armaments for new warriors. Extra resources are granted at the fort this unit is located in. So wherever he's at, we can build more guys. And forge bonus. The mage is very efficient when forging magic items. The bonus is the cost reduction in gems. Magic gems are a resource we get in this game, and we have to use those to make magic items. So we're going to be recruiting quite a few of these guys, and we're going to build some powerful magic items for our barbarian hordes to wield in battle. It's going to be great. Next up, we have the Shaman. The Warriors of Ulm are a superstitious lot, afraid of magic and spirits. Fear of the spirit world and its inhabitants influences everyday life in the wild forest. Shamans are able to communicate with the spirits of the dead and the wild and guide the warriors' tribes in spiritual matters. All shamans have some skill in earth magic due to the spirits of the mountains and metals being the most important in Ulmic beliefs. So here is our shaman. A shaman gets a level 1 in earth, has a priest level 1 spell, so they can cast what's called a blessed spell, which can make our sacred warriors better. We'll talk about that in a bit. They also get, again, one random magic level. They could get earth level 2 or something else. They give us 7 research points. They themselves are sacred. Sacred troops are extremely devoted to the god's cause. They can be blessed and only require half the usual cost to maintain. Cold and snow. Sneaky boys. They're also mountain survival, forest survival. Unfortunately, they are bad at research. An inept researcher is, in, is unsuited to magical research. It performs his task more slowly than others. So they're not very good at researching. We want our smiths to be thinking about new magic spells these guys are going to be out in battle actually doing the spells for us. And last up, our Antlered Shaman, which can only be recruited in our capital city. So all of our other leaders we can get anywhere there's a forest or anywhere we have a fort. Uh, but these guys only in our capital. In the deep forest of Ulm stands sacred Ermisul, an immense black oak older than the forest itself. It is tended by antlered shamans, priests, and spirit guides of the wild, dressed in hides, bones, and antlered hood. The antlered shamans are the highest priests of all, skilled in the magics of earth and nature. By watching signs in the great oak, they divine the will of the forest and the awakening lord. They are not seen often, as they rarely venture far from their forest of Ermenzul. So, expensive, hard to make, but level 2 earth magic? level 2 nature magic there are level 1 priests they do research okay they are sacred again they can be blessed for special powers cold snow sneaky mountains and supply bonus where whoever's army they're in gets extra food basically because we got a shaman here we got an antlered shaman he can call forth food from the ground squirrels just come right into your hand and you can eat the squirrel live just there maybe Maybe that's not the best image now that I think about it. Yeah, let's just pretend we didn't talk about eating live squirrels. Okay. So those are the leaders of our army. So what about our armies themselves? We have Axe Warriors. The inhabitants of the Wilderness of Ulm are strong and proud. They are as resilient as the mountains and as strong as oaks. They live off the land and are skilled woodsmen and mountaineers. Upon coming of age, every man makes his choice of weapon. The Axe Warrior is skilled in axe throwing. Two weapon fighting, stealth, and wilderness survival. They are used to fight in loose formations. So, our axe guy here doesn't wear as good armor, leather armor, iron cap, has two axes, double axing it up, and he also has a throwing axe, which, uh, does he have an ammo count? I don't know if they have ammo. What if they, oh, they only have one axe, maybe. 
So, it looks like I'm imagining it's. I don't know if this is unlimited ammo or maybe he only gets one a battle. I'm not sure, but he can throw an axe at the enemy from range 12, and then he can go in and he can get the soon knife him with his axes. That's pretty cool. Not a lot of protection, only 10 in protection. All right, and we have a regular warrior. The inhabitants of the wilderness, ah, of all are strong and proud. They are as resilient as the mountains and as strong as oaks. They live off the land and are skilled woodsmen and mountaineers. Upon coming of age, every man makes his choice of weapon. Those who choose the sword are trained in two-weapon fighting, stealth, and wilderness survival. They are used to fight in loose formations. So here we have cold resistant, our cold stuff, sneaky, mountain forest survival, skirmisher, a trained skirmisher do not suffer morale penalties when fighting in a skirmish or sparse line formation. All members of the squad must have this ability. Uh, we can spread them out, basically, without them having a lowered morale. And ambidextrous, of course, and they get an axe and a broadsword. Again, not very good armor, but axe and broadsword, you know, two different types of weapon. Then we have our archers. Warfare and strife is a way of life in Ulm, and women as well as men must be prepared to defend their village. Thus, all women are trained in battle. Most of them use bows. So they have a short sword for close-range combat. They also have a short bow, range of 35. Not very good armor. You can see their protection is only a 4. Most of our other troops have had a protection of 10. There are skirmishers as well, and then all the cold mountain and forest barbarian living. We'll just call that barbarian living from now on. Now we have our forest warriors. Brave axe warriors can become forest warriors. They use heavy scale armor and wear green cloaks. Forest warriors rely on their armor rather than stealth for protection. They are used to fight in a loose formation. So exactly the same as our other axe warriors, but the difference is we have a scale male hubric, uh, which means the halberk, is that how you say that word? I'm sure I'll mispronounce that. I want to say Hubrick, but that's more like Stanley, Stanley Kubrick. Um, better armor, better protection, uh, but we lose the, the stealth capability, which I think we had here, right? Boom, stealthy. So they're not a stealthy group. We have our mountain warrior. Brave warriors can become mountain warriors. They use heavy scale armor and wear white cloaks. Mountain warriors rely on their armor rather than the stealth of protection. They are used to fight loose formations. Same thing here again. We have got Barbarian Livin, Skirmisher, and Better Armor, 13. No sneaky. Then we have Warrior Maidens. Women who give up the prospect of rearing a, rearing a family may choose to marry the spirits of war. These Warrior Maidens do not fight only to defend their village, but join their fellow men in conquest. Warrior Maidens use scale mail Quiresses that give them good protection and maneuverability. So scale mail right here, iron cap, short sword, get a bow. Um, kind of all around generalist fighters, it looks like. But again, protection of 11 as opposed to 4 on our other archers. We have the shield maiden. So our shield maiden here. Some girls of exceptional bravery are trained in melee combat rather than archery. Shield maidens fight with short sword and shield, weapons not used by the menfolk of Ulm. The use of shields was once despised as cowardly in Ulm, but since the shield maidens come out victorious from a number of battles in which they were outnumbered, they have become respected and are considered a force to be reckoned with. So shield maidens get a short sword, pretty average damage, um, barbarian living with sneakiness, they're skirmishers, but they get a shield. Shields are neat because shields can actually um, can actually get hit instead of your character. So while their protection is lower, you can see they have a defense skill of 15. Where if we go to our guy here, higher protection but lower defense skill. What that means, if I'm remembering correctly, and I could be wrong, this should be... Ability to avoid getting hit in melee combat. So, the shield maidens are better at not getting hit because they have a shield. They can block. But when they get hit, they only have a protection of 11. This is their actual armor, right? 
Uh, thickness of any armor. Correct. Um, so, okay armor, better defense. We go to our guys over here. Not as good a defense, they're going to get hit more, but their armor is a little bit better. I like the shield, because it's better not to get hit. We also have Iron Warriors. Sons of Smiths are trained for birth to fight with war malls. Those who do not follow their father's trade become Iron Warriors. Respected warriors with heavy armor and war malls. They are used to fight in loose formation. Barbarian living. Armor. It's okay. Here's the big thing. They got a big old two-handed maul. Kraken skulls. Teaching the enemy who's boss. We have our Steel Maidens. Ooh. Some girls' exceptional bravery are trained in melee combat rather than archery. Steel Maidens are the most feared of the Warrior Maidens. They are stealthy and fight with great skill and swiftness. Ever since, a contingent of Steel Maidens surprised and slew an Emorian Legion and their Pontifex, they have been declared eternal enemies of that nation. So here, we get our Barbarian Living, Skirmishers, Ambidextrous, two short swords, Scale mail, iron cap, a little bit defense, a little bit protection. If we could find a way to give them like super fast attacks, maybe they'd be really cool because they got two weapons. We'll see. And last but not least, we have the Steel Warrior, and this is our sacred unit. So, fatherless children are treated harshly in Ul. They are kept as slaves and brought to the Wheel of Pain where they are forced to do heavy labor while exposed to the elements. I mean, think of Conan pushing that wheel. Pushing the, uh, the big cog before they send him to the fighting pits. Those few who survive are adopted by the shamans and given training by spirits of ancient swordsmen summoned by the shamans. Steel warriors are sacred and fight with great two-handed swords. So our steel warriors, they're expensive. Look at this resource. We, have to, we can only get a few of them at a time. We can only get them in our capital. But look at this. 13 protection. That's as good as our guys in armor. 13 defense skill. That's better than everyone except for the shield maiden with her shield. They are got to their barbarian living skirmishers. They're sacred, so we can bless them. So they can do cool things in combat if we can bless them. Maybe we'll have a bunch of these guys and make them super cool. Um, and look at this sword. Length 2. Um, attack 14, damage 25. I mean, they're just going to be cutting people in twain. Oh, yeah. Now, we also have our sights. We have the Wheel of Pain. It enables the recruitment of Steel Warriors. And we have... Ermin Soul. Ermin Soul is going... The, the Magic Tree is going to give us the following every turn. We're going to get one Death Gem. We're going to get one two Nature Gems. We're going to get three Earth Gems, and we can recruit the Antlered Shaman. So, these are our two magical sites. That's all of our troops, everybody. And that is our commanders. So that's the breakdown of our country and our troops. When we come back in the next episode, we will create our god, and we will go ahead and begin the game. Folks, it's good to be back in Dominions. It's good to be going through another big strategy. I hope you're ready for an exciting time of us failing to beat the computer in Dominions 5. Until next time, I want to say thanks for watching. Please tell your friends. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe. And as always, we hope to see you soon.